Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Eric Moore. Sorry, we're waiting for the microphone, but I'm going to use this one instead. So it's great to be here, and it's a tough act to follow with the amazing conversations that have happened so far. Uh, what I want to focus on today is the operationalization of UDL. Some of the people in this room are already like, oh no, seems like we've been through this many times. But what I want to introduce is a new way to think about the operationalization of universal design for learning and explore why it's so important that we have this conversation until it comes to con conclusion. So this talk is called Capture, Don't Compress, Operationalizing Universal Design for Learning Meaningfully. Let me start by looking at the amazing, bountiful ways that Universal Design for Learning has already shown up in policy, at least here in the United States. It shows up, for example, in the Nation National Instructional Materials Access Accessibility Standards of 2006 and the Higher Education Opportunity Act of 2008, the Common Core State Standards Initiatives of 2010, the National Education Technology Plan, also of 2010, and most recently in the Every Student Succeeds Act, it is mentioned and mentioned and mentioned and mentioned 17 times to be exact. And then this has nothing to say of the many state and other national initiatives and local initiatives that we see as school districts and other types of local policies that demonstrate how important universal design for learning is from this pers policy perspective. Now, I've been studying teacher education and education in general for the last about five years. And in this time, I've come to learn that when we have this type of policy, for the last 30 years or so, policy has needed to be well balanced with a rigorous scientific empirical research. I've looked, for example, in the United States at the uh, Nation at Risk document that came out in the 1980s that was challenging the degree to which we were actually practicing best practices in education and forced this initiative of trying to be more scientifically oriented. You would suspect then that with the degree to which we have policy uh, surrounding universal design for learning, that there would be a balance with the way that it has been empirically researched. However, what we find in the literature, the modern literature, including from several people who are here today, that UDL lacks a clear operationalization. And Dave Ediburn, who's also here, would said, without that, it might not be researchable at all. Now, if I follow the breadcrumb trail and I look over at the UDL Center, the National Center on Universal Design for Learning, they have a different narrative. They say that the Universal Design for Learning guidelines are based on research from several different fields and from many different researchers at many different universities and research organizations. That research has been reviewed, compiled, organized by educators and researchers that cast in a process that spans a 10-year period and involves several different stages. Now that sounds research-based to me. So I'm a little bit unclear here. On the one hand, UDL is based on research, and on the other hand, it's, uh, it's not researchable. Based on research? Not researchable. <laughs> I'm not sure how we make sense of this, paradox that we have in the literature right now. And I think it's important for us to have this discussion. Last year, Elisa stood up where I am now, and she said that UDL is a framework which is more than the sum of its parts. I think that's a really important way to understand where this disagreement might be coming from. If you look at the 31 checkpoints involved in the UDL guidelines, and you look on the UDL Center website, each one of those is backed up by rigorous research, both scientific, empirical, and quantitative, qualitative case studies. It's all there. Each one of those checkpoints is beautifully supported by research in several different fields, exactly as they claim. However, if we take what Elisa was saying seriously, it means that the 31 checkpoints, even taken all together, the nine guidelines, the three principles, those all together are not UDL. Which leaves us with, well then, what is it? That's what we mean when we talk about operationalizing UDL. Any one of those 31 checkpoints is researched and researched and researched, but that doesn't mean that the whole framework of UDL itself is supported by that research if it is a different construct. Does this make sense? 
So let's put this into practice. Let's imagine that you are a researcher or an administrator, and you want to know if your teachers are practicing UDL. And you have one teacher who says, yes, yes, I am practicing UDL in my lesson today. And you go and you watch them. And what they're using is checkpoint 2.5. I'm using the old guidelines. Checkpoint 4.2, checkpoint 8.3. They're drawing from the three different principles with specific methods guided by those checkpoints for their practice. And you say, yes, yes, that looks like UDL to me. And another teacher says, well, yeah, I am too. And you go into his classroom, and he's doing 1.3 and 3.4 and 9.2, and the methods associated with those checkpoints are completely different. So what I've now observed in these two classrooms are two people who both say I'm practicing UDL, but they're doing things that look nothing alike. And it becomes difficult for me to understand how I can use these two separate cases to say, yes, UDL is working. Now, there are many possible combinations of any three of the UDL checkpoints. In fact, if you do a permutation calculation, there are actually 4,495 different ways that any one of those three 31 checkpoints could be combined in the practice of universal design for learning. Who said there had to be three? Right? I mean, there's other conversations here, too. Uh, do they have to come from all three principles? Or do I feel like in this lesson, it's really just representation that needs to be addressed? We're still talking about that. Right? Or on what basis are they chosen? Can I say I'm going to go into this week focusing on this guideline, whatever I'm teaching? Or do I have to say, no, because of what I'm teaching and the predictable barriers that that's going to create, that's why I'm going to choose these checkpoints? I've heard both of those this week with good reason. And does it have to be permanent? Is it some, a systematic change that I'm making to my classroom to say, now I'm practicing UDL? Or can we tell beginning teachers, you just need to get started. Just, just do something tomorrow, and you can start practicing UDL? There's discussion there as well. This is enough to make a researcher tear their hair out, <laughs> I think. So on the one hand, I think that it is absolutely true. I agree with CAST 100% that UDL is based on research. But in some ways, I might also agree with those who say, but it's not research-based. And this seems like a paradox, but I think these statements can both be true once we understand that UDL is more than the sum of its parts. All of the parts are researched, but that doesn't mean that the framework itself has been researched to this degree. Does it matter? Does it mean that because we haven't scientifically researched UDL that it is not evidence-based? Well, Whithurt, who was the Associate Secretary of Education in the early 20th century, said, no. There's many ways to provide evidence for education practices. Scientific research is just one form of empirical evidence, in fact. The difference between empirical information and scientific research might be in the degree to which there is a rigorous control of the variables. Many of us who have practiced universal design for learning in our classrooms have said, I have seen my students' performance improve. That's empirical evidence. Even if I didn't control the variables and do it in a rigorous scientific fashion, which is what would make it scientific research. Now, Whithurst went on to say further, that's actually only one branch of the way that we provide evidence in education. There are other ways as well. When we have individual experience, that counts for something. Everybody in this room is either a parent or a professional educator, both of which are responsible for knowing your students and being intentional about meeting their needs. And your voice matters, even if the research hasn't caught up to you. If you say, I have experienced the bounty of this, then that counts for something. And then here we have a room, this amazing conference full of over, what are we, 250 people? And people streaming online from three continents? We have consensus. We are here together to say, we believe in universal design for learning. We Brilliant minds in this room have come to consensus. And thus, I think we do have lots of evidence to support universal design for learning from several perspectives. The one keystone that is yet missing is being able to validate it with empirical, rigorous, scientific research. And there are those who will point to that like a thorn in our side and say, do you really have empirical evidence? 
do you really have an evidence-based practice? And I feel like it's a conversation that we need to continue to return to. And I wonder after 10 years of this, it's been seven years since Dave Edeburn published his paper, Would You Recognize It If You Saw It? Explicitly calling our field to do something about this. And we're still talking about it today. I wonder if it's time for us to have a talk. Can we operationalize UDL? I say yes, but, and as my algebra teacher used to say, what's the but? Well, I think operationalization is built on exactness, repeatability, objectivity. Whereas the practice of UDL, as many of you know, the beauty of it is in its dynamics. That's what makes UDL UDL that it changes based on my circumstances, the lesson, the students, the day. Its very flexibility is what keeps it alive. It's almost like if you wanted to study butterflies. My six-year-old son is getting really into butterflies now. And so as summer is coming, I'm looking forward to bringing him out into these meadows where I live in Tennessee where there's butterflies all over the place. And I want him to really understand butterflies as they actually live. And I wonder if Udiana's dynamics can be compared to a butterfly being studied in nature. And you learn so much from watching them as they flutter around. You can pin them down and study them that way. But as soon as you do, you kill it. Douglas Adams once said, if you take a cat apart to figure out how it works, the first thing you have is a not working cat. <laughs> I wonder if UDL is like that. I wonder what would happen if we approached the operationalization of UDL, not by focusing first on what it is, but what it isn't. And here I tip my hat again to Dave Eddyburn because in his 2010 paper, his 10 propositions, seven of them were framed in the negative, in which he said, UDL is not this. And he said he had seven of his propositions. It's important to recognize that these are propositions, and we can continue to discuss these, and we're going to. But he said, for example, UDL is not parallel to UD architecture. It's not just good teaching or what we've always done. It's not natural or simple. It's not low-tech or no-tech, it's not assistive technology, and it's not simply about the primary target or the primary impact. In other words, we're not just focusing on Jimmy with dyslexia, we're focusing on changing my environment, and Jimmy will benefit from that as well as his, his peers. Now, I wonder if we can take these negatives and use them to form a perimeter fence. So that when we start talking about UDL, we can say as soon as somebody says, we're going to practice UDL by using assistive technology, we can say, stop. That's not UDL anymore. If we can have these clear definitions of what it is not, I think we've gone light years towards exploring what it is. And this allows us to create a territory a broad range of things in which UDL can be all the way from the preschool and Head Start programs through higher education. I drew this tentatively. From my understanding and my experience of UDL, what's in the yellow box is, I think, the territory of UDL. UDL is learning designed proactively, drawing intentionally from the UDL guidelines to actively reduce or remove barriers for predictably variable students, including those with disabilities. There are several key words in here that I think could be operationalized in a study, in a classroom, in which we can say, here's how I was proactive. This is how I drew from the guidelines. This is how I identified barriers and used the guidelines to address those barriers. And that's going to look very different depending on the circumstances in which it is done. That allows for a movement within there and the boundary lines, the, the perimeter fence by the negatives allows us to say when we have fallen off the map. So can UDL be operationalized? I say yes, but. Operationalization should be territorial, not precise. It's a postmodern, not modern. I think that this has important implications for both teaching, research, and administration, and I think it has important benefits. In this framework, teachers might and researchers may be able to and must be able to explicate their context and their thought process. If you're going to practice UDL, that intentionality requires me to say, here was my goal. These were the barriers I expected. Here's how I provided options to my students to address those predicted variables. 
expl explicating that thought process is going to be necessary for operationalizing a more local form of UDL for the context of my classroom or my study. I think this has important benefits. This might give us the semi-objective measure by which the operationalization of UDL could be established. Right now, there's a lot of dialogue about this claims to be UDL in the literature, but I don't think it is. Now we could say it violates number seven of our perimeter fence, and that's why it's not UDL. It would give us the language to be clear about where those boundaries are and give us focus as a community for how to work together. I think also it would allow us to exemplify the thought process necessary to actualize universal design for learning in context. I think the people who are reading our papers or who are coming into our classrooms can now look at our lesson plans and learn UDL not just by watching what we did, but how we came to do it, what decisions we made in the process. And in this way, we can spread the practice of universal design for learning, which is ultimately grounded in the design aspect. I want to hear from you. So I've given you a link here. You can follow the bit link or you can scan the QR code. And when you follow this, it's going to give you the opportunity to sound off. I don't think that I'm the sole purpose person who can define what those boundary lines are or belongs in the center box. And I want to hear from the community. What do you think would be disqualifying? for something to no longer be UDL? And what do you think is the most universal, most essential aspect of universal design for learning that belongs in the middle? What I've shown you as my territory, territorial figure is just a draft, just an idea to start this conversation. And I think together we can build it. There's also an opportunity there for us to begin networking for those who are interested in putting this into practice. I think that when we can get this done, and we can now move beyond this question of can an UDL be operationalized? We can show yes and this is how we're doing it. Then we can build that capstone of empirical research-based evidence. And then when we're confronted with the doubters, the challengers, the financiers, the seekers, and they say, is UDL really evidence-based? We can say to them without the shadow of a doubt, you know what? Let me show you. Thank you.